last month, we revisited some cool British singles released in March 1967. Now it's time to do the same with April of that year. Here we go. Pictures of Lilith made my life so wonderful. April 1967 saw the release of Pictures of Lily by The Who. The song was recorded at IBC Studios in London and produced by their manager Kit Lambert. Yeah. You keep jumping on John's name. Yeah, sure. You, John, John's usually louder than everyone else anyway. Yeah. You know, and right. if anyone needs really backing help. up, it's sort of yeah. me. Uh, Keith, when you hit the very high note, back off a bit because you're, gonna, you're really piercing because of the height of the thing. The single got excellent reviews in the press. The melody maker wrote, They get better and they get better. The Who, as a group, and their records. The impact is greater probably than any of their previous hits, and it should outdistance Happy Jack in a matter of days. It's a rollicking rhythmic Pete Townsend composition with a beautiful lyric and his usual cynical cutting edge. Marvelous muscular music, surely, they are moving into a class of their own, and this record should open even more gates. The single became a top 5 hit in the UK, peaking at number 4, and it was a top 10 hit in several European countries such as Germany, the Netherlands and Belgium. In the States, it failed to break into the top 50, peaking at number 51. April 1967 also saw the release of Little Games by the Yardbirds. This was the first single they released after becoming a quartet with Jimmy Page as the sole guitarist. Both sides of the single were recorded at Olympic Studios in London and produced by Mickey Most. At the time, the Yardbirds were touring the States extensively, with frequent shows at popular counterculture venues such as the Fillmore. And they were becoming more experimental with longer improvised performances. Their live sets even included a cover of Waiting for the Man by the Velvet Underground. However, EMI decided to hire pop producer Mickey Most, and as a result, the single failed to reflect the evolution in the Yardbird's musical direction. Penny Valentine reviewed the single for Disc Magazine. Penny Valentine wrote, It's an odd cross between new Yardbirds and old Yardbirds with a snatch of the guitar sound just to prove they don't miss Jeff Beck. Written partly by Phil Wayman, who a long time ago had a record himself called Hear Me a Drummer Man that I liked, it has an odd insistence and words of social significance and some nice cellos. I rather liked it. The B-side was a decent tune called Puzzles, although the highlight of the song was Jimmy Page's guitar solo. Despite the label's attempt to make the Yardbird sound more commercially appealing, the single failed to chart in Britain. And it didn't fare much better in the US, where it didn't even enter the top 50. Denny Lane released his debut single as a solo artist in April 1967, after leaving the Moody Blues in late 1966. Say You Don't Mind was produced by Denny Cordell, and it featured a string arrangement by John Paul Jones. The British press was quite enthusiastic about the single, Penny Valentine wrote. This is Denny's first solo record since his split with the Moody Blues. And for the real effect, you should play it at least five times. I know people will say this is cheating because a hit will smack into you on first playing. But I don't always think this is true, certainly not with this record. Beautifully arranged and produced with guitars and strings sounding as they never have before, clean and clear as crystal water. My only complaint is that he has a lovely pained voice and by double tracking it, they've submerged the quality a little. A favorite though in spite of that. The song failed to chart. However, it became a top 20 hit in 1972, when it was covered by former Zombies frontman Colin Blunston. Just one more chance is all I need. Despite being commercially unsuccessful when it was originally released, this single by The Outer Limits is one of the highlights of April 1967. Both sides were excellent, and not surprisingly, both songs have been featured on several compilations over the years. The Outer Limits are mostly remembered for being Jeff Christie's first band. Later in 1970, he formed the band Christie, and had a few major hits with songs such as Yellow River or San Bernardino. 
The A-side was an excellent pop song with an irresistible melody, which seemed to merge the mod sounds from that era with the emerging psychedelia from early 1967. On the other hand, the B-side was more akin to the sort of garage rock sounds that were coming out of the States during that period. Record Mirror reported, Their story is quite involved. The four boys started in Leeds as a skiffle group called 3G's Plus One. But the group had a bad car crash which resulted in a smashed van, two wrecked guitars, four broken ribs, and three severe concussions. And later the bass player got tuberculosis. But Jeff Christie's dad eventually said he would lend them £300 to see how things worked out as a group. They went on to success in universities and clubs and to their new record contract. Drew Harvey records them. The New Musical Express gave the single a good review. Shimmering organ flecked sound, blends with pounding beat and appealing vocal. Good tune as well, it maintains the high Derham standard. Despite the good reviews, the single failed to chart. Even though the Bee Gees released several singles and albums in Australia, this was the first single they released after moving to Britain in early 1967. The single was recorded at IBC Studios in London and produced by Ossie Byrne and manager Robert Stigwood. At the time, many people who heard New York Mining Disaster on the radio thought it was a Lennon-McCartney composition. And some people even thought it was the Beatles recording under a pseudonym. Disc Magazine reported, New group The Bee Gees lashed out this week at widespread rumors that their new single had been written by Beatles John and Paul. 20-year-old Barry Gibbs said, We've always written our own songs. I've been writing since I was 10, before Lennon and McCartney were even on stage. People can say what they like. If they don't believe us, they can ask the Beatles themselves. The song got great reviews in the press. Penny Valentine wrote, I don't think I've ever heard a group that sounds so like the Beatles as this one does. Not intentionally, but in the strength of their songwriting and the production of their voices and backing. Therefore, please take note of this group, for it seems that they must be destined for fine things. New York mining disaster was a hit worldwide. It reached number 12 in the UK and it was a top 10 hit in several European countries and in Australia. In the States, it peaked at number 14 according to Billboard. In the The highlight of this single by the Artwoods, just like many singles from 1967, was the B-side. The A-side, a moody number called What Shall I Do, was also a good song. But it didn't seem to be as strong and adventurous as the flip side. The Artwoods featured future Deep Purple member John Lord on organ and Ronnie Wood's older brother, Artwood, on vocals. And this was the last single they released as the Artwoods. Despite being a very popular club band in the UK, chart success always eluded them. And this 45 from April 1967 was no exception. The New Musical Express wrote, A very underrated group, adept at purveying commercialized R&B. Mid-tempo with the bluesy moody effect heightened by the minor key. It features the lead singer, organ, and some fascinating guitar work. The flip side is a thundering beat with lengthy organ and guitar passages and a strangely haunting jungle-like effect. Reminded me a bit of the Yardbirds. The single failed to chart. Even though The Herd had already released a couple of 45s in 1966, this was the first single they put out after 16-year-old Peter Frampton joined the band as their lead singer and guitarist. The song got mixed reviews in the press. The Melody Maker wrote, This is a compact little group presently doing a ton down at London's Marquee Club. And now they get another airing on record under the watchful eye of Ken Howard and Alan Blakely, who composed this, their first psychedelic song already. Not surprisingly, there is a Dave D feel to the number. And Steve Rowland's production leaves me cold as usual. Without wishing to be a downer, we can only say that if you're going to freak, please do it properly. Believe it or not, there is good and bad psychedelic music. 
The Herd scored a major hit a few months later with the song from the underworld. But this, their first single with Peter Frampton, was a flop. This single, is another one of those singles from 1967, that became a cult classic among fans of British psychedelia despite being a commercial failure when it was originally released. Both sides of this single have appeared on several compilations over the years, and rightfully so. The band, which was formed in 1966 by Bob Ponton and Martin Curtis, sounded like a mix between the mid-60s sound of The Who and the early psychedelia of The Beatles' Revolver. The A-side, with its backwards fuzz guitar, is an obvious highlight. But the B-side was also an excellent track that could easily have been the top side. This was the second of three singles they released for CBS. This 45, however, wasn't even reviewed by the British press and it sold next to nothing. It's now a highly sought-after collector's item. In April 1967, The Quick released a cover of a young rascal's song as a single. But again, the highlight here was the B-side. This instrumental called Bert's Apple Crumble is a classic in the mod club scene since the mod revival of the late 70s. It's also very likely that DJs in 1967 were spinning this B-side and turning it into a club favorite. The popularity in the clubs is probably the reason why, just a few weeks after this 45 was released, Record Mirror published several ads promoting the B-side of the single instead of the A-side. The song has appeared on several compilations over the years, and the single was even reissued in 2005. As a curious note, Tom Petty used the song as the closing music of his Buried Treasures radio show. My arms were reaching out to hold her. Just like Peter Frampton, another underage singer who released his first single in April 1967 was Terry Reid. Terry Reid joined Peter Jay and the Jaywalkers in 1966 when he was 15 years old, and this was the first single he released with the band. The song was just a run-of-the-mill soul-influenced number, but Terry Reid's vocals were quite impressive, and the British press was not oblivious to his strong vocal performance on the song. Penny Valentine wrote, I chose this record not because the song is fantastic or I think the record will be a hit, but because the singer is good and the whole thing sounds like one day they're going to produce something super. This is good though, backed by Peter Jay's Jaywalkers with heraldic brass sound. Apparently, Terry Reid was discovered by Paul Jones, and there is a lot of the Jones style and pretty flamingo at the beginning. Then he goes mad and hits heights of unparalleled coarse-voiced singing. The single failed to chart. Just one more chance is all I, need. I hope you enjoyed this trip back to April 1967. See you next time.